I've had a habit of writing all of my own SQL queries for years now when it comes to making my own applications. And I know there's things like Entity Framework Core around, but I just can't seem to get in the habit of using them. Hi, my name is Nick Cosentino, and I'm a Principal Software Engineering Manager at Microsoft. In this video, we're going to look at Dapper instead of Entity Framework Core, and alongside that, we're going to be looking at the strongly typed ID library from Andrew Locke. I've only recently started using Dapper, but I've absolutely fallen in love with it because it fits the way that I like to write code perfectly. In this video, I want to walk through how we can leverage strongly typed IDs alongside Dapper and a couple of little tweaks and changes that I've done to what Andrew Locke has suggested in terms of being able to make these things work together. A quick reminder to subscribe to the channel and check the pinned comment below for my courses on Dome Train. Now let's jump over to Visual Studio and check this out. All right, on my screen, I have something that's a very simple repository pattern along with a record, right? So this record is just going to have an ID. You can see that it's a long type and the value is a string type here. And the repository itself, like I said, it's going to be very, very simple. It is going to be using MySQL in the backing for this, but it's not really important for this conversation. So Dapper can interface with different databases depending on how you want to connect to things. All that I'm doing here is I have a create method. You can see that I have to write the SQL for it. And again, as I mentioned at the beginning of this video, this is really a habit that I've had for a long time. I like writing my own SQL. I don't want to have any mysteries with what's going on behind the scenes. And for me, I prefer it this way. To each their own, I know a lot of people love using Entity Framework Core, and that's totally cool too. I'm not here to convince you otherwise, I'm just walking you through what I got going on. What we're able to do with Dapper is simply take the record that's passed in, and you can see that on the parameters parameter here that I'm passing in record, and that's just going to mean that it's able to map the record we're passing in into these value arguments that we have here. This way we don't have to go manually add the properties and map them onto different command parameters that we would pass over to SQL. It's just all handled behind the scenes for us. So in my opinion, this is one step more clean, if you will, than what I would do on my own. Because otherwise, for every type of repository I'd be creating, I'd end up going to do this myself. So just a little bit more streamlined. If we go a little bit lower, we can see I just have another method that kind of does the opposite, right? So I'm going to go look up a record by the ID that we pass in. And this actually should say long for now because we're going to get into the strongly typed IDs in just a moment. But for now, if you were to go look this stuff up, you'd be able to go find by the ID a certain record. And Dapper, again, kind of saves the day for us because it will go translate. You can see it, I'm... Uh, aliasing these here, right? So the ID to capital I, then D, and then value with a capital V on it. Doing that allows these to map to the record properties that we have. And as a result, Dapper knows how to map those. So we pass in the ID this time only because that's the only parameter we need to go into the SQL query. And then we get the record out. But that's going to bring us over to this ID here, right? So you saw me change this. And if we go back up and we look at the structure of our record, we can see that the record itself has a long ID on it. Now I wanna pause for a second because some people may not be familiar with strongly typed IDs and I kinda of just wanna explain this very briefly before continuing on, especially if you're new to it. If you're not new to it, you can skip ahead a little bit, but this is just my little preamble to give people enough context if they're not familiar. So the idea with strongly typed IDs is that if you don't have them and we have other types of records and things like that, so maybe there's a handful of different entities that we're dealing with. So you might have something that's, you know, better named than my record, but you have these other repositories and stuff like that. And they all have their own ID, right? Maybe you have customers and products or you have services and you have different types of things that you have in your database. If they all have different IDs, but they're all longs, let's say, it means that when you're writing code, it's very easy for you to mess up and pass the wrong ID in place. It's kind of like if you had a system where you could pass an email around or a phone number or a username and they're all strings, what ends up happening if you pass the wrong one, right? Like you're not going to catch it at compile time because they're all strings. And as a result, you have a bug that shows up later and you're going, oh crap, I passed the wrong string. The same thing can happen, and it happens a lot when you have really simple ID types. Strongly typed IDs allow us to work around this, but the challenge is that it's kind of silly or it feels like it's a lot of boilerplate code to have to go write a whole type just to go replace something like a long. And then you have to go do it X number of times for all of the different IDs that you have. So Andrew Locke has an awesome library that we can use to work around that. 
And if I go expand this code, this is all that we need to do to go make our own strongly typed ID. So you can see here that I have strongly typed ID as an attribute, and then we can pass in the template that's long because I wanted to have a long type backing my strongly typed ID, and then I just give it a name. The important thing to note here is that this has to be marked as partial, and that way that the code generator can go generate the code for this struct that we have, and that's kind of behind the scenes, but this allows us to get that code generated through Roslyn. Now from there, what we're able to do is take this and we can replace the ID that we have on our record, which is great because now when you go to create this record, you do have to use a my record ID, that specific type and not just a long. So if we go back around here, that means if we wanted to go look up this ID, we could change our signature of this method and say, look, if you're trying to find these things by their ID, you need to give us the specific type. So this just really enhances the type safety in our system. A lot of the time I've shied away from this just because I didn't have a really good solution. I had heard about Andrew Locke's strongly typed ID package that he has, and I figured, okay, it's time to use it for this particular project. So it's been a really cool experience so far using Dapper alongside this. But the problem is that as soon as you go to do this, if we don't make any other changes, all of a sudden Dapper does not know what to do when it goes to read this object back in. And that's because it doesn't know, it doesn't have any idea what this type is. If we go back up here, it doesn't know what my record ID is. It knows about the simple types we have. So if you have a string or a long or a date time, because these things translate well into database concepts that we have. But my record ID is not a concept that exists. In Andrew Locke's blog that he has, he shows that you can use a SQL mapper in Dapper to basically tell Dapper, when you encounter something like this, we know how to go translate it. But while this works perfectly fine, one of the things that I'm not a big fan of is that we would need one of these mappers for every single ID type that we want to have. So that means if we had a system with 10 different entities, for example, and each one had an ID, even if they were all based on a long type, it would mean that we would need 10 different instances or variations even of these mappers to have for each one of these types. And because I use a lot of plugin style things, this kind of goes against a lot of the design philosophies I have. I kind of want this stuff to happen more automatically instead of forcing people to remember to go do it. So again, nothing wrong with what Andrew Locke has suggested. I think it's great that he has these things working together, but I wanted to enhance it a little bit more. So I want to show you that. Before continuing on, just a quick note from this video's sponsor, which is Pact Publishing. Pact has plenty of awesome C Sharp and .NET books. In particular, I have this one here, Architecting ASP.NET Core Applications. And I actually have a foreword in this book, which is really cool. So in this book, you can learn all about building ASP.NET Core applications. And in addition to that, you can see how you can leverage design patterns in those applications and learn how to test all included in the book with plenty of examples. So I highly recommend you check it out and you can find the links in the description of the comments below. Thanks, and back to the video. Okay, so this is going to be the first version of this strong type dapper mapper, sounds pretty cool, right? That I'm gonna walk you through. This does use some reflection and assembly scanning, so I'm not necessarily suggesting that you have to do it this way, but this is how I've set it up in my own application. I just want you to kind of think about the concepts that are going on here and how you could apply it in your own code. Again, because I leverage a lot of plugins, I need to be able to scan through assemblies to be able to make some of this magic happen. So what I'm going to be doing is looking across the assemblies, getting the types out of it, and then looking for anything that has one of these attributes on it, this generated code attribute, right? And then in particular, I need to look for strongly typed ID. There's probably potentially a better way to go look up types based on this. But when I was doing a little bit of poking around and basically investigating through reflection, how these things get mapped, what you're not seeing at runtime is anything to do with this, like this strongly typed ID, this does not show up at runtime. But instead, if I go all the way back up here, we do get this one that says generated code attribute, but the tool property that we have on there is called strongly typed ID. If we want to go find the types that are strongly typed IDs, this code is what handles that. Now that we've identified one of those types, and by the way, I'm just gonna be returning a tuple back that has three things in it. So this is going to be something that I filter out, by the way. So once I have a matching type, if we basically don't return out, I'm gonna ask for the constructor. 
And then I'm going to ask for the parameter that gets passed into that constructor. And from there, I'm going to return back the actual type, right? So that's the strong type that we're dealing with, the strong type ID. Then I'm going to get the type that is backing that strong type. And then I'm going to ask for the constructor. These are three things that I'm going to need to be able to create instances of these strong types. I'm going to pause for just a second, because if you're seeing the reflection stuff going on and going, hold on, this doesn't seem like it's going to work so well. Bear with me for a second, because there's an enhancement to this that I want to show you. However, it's not totally working yet, but I want to seed the idea with you if you stick to the end of this video. We do need these three pieces of data. And then what I'm going to do from there, like I said, I'm going to filter out when we don't have a proper match. And then I'm going to step through all of these pairs to do some registration. And that way I don't have to go make a whole new mapper for each one of the things that goes and implements a strongly typed ID backed by a long in this case. For now, I would have to go make it if you had things that were mapped by strings or ints and other variations, but you would only need one of these per. The better solution that I want to implement only needs one of these. You don't have to do it for each backing type, but stay tuned because we'll get to that in a moment. Basically what I'm doing is I'm just checking to make sure for now, because in my case, I'm only doing this for longs. So if anyone accidentally set this up not for longs, for their strongly typed IDs, this is going to throw an exception. We'll know pretty early if something's broken. Then what I'm going to do from there is get some types going on here. So this is a bunch of reflection. So this is going to allow us to make a generic type. And from there, we end up calling these two things together to get the class, right? So the type that represents the generic type, it's a little bit meta, but bear with me for a little bit. What we need to do from there is uh, get the method that's going to allow us to access the property through reflection. So there is a bunch of reflection going on here, but we're going to cache these things so that we don't have to keep looking them up. Now from there, one more little bit of reflection. I'm going to use activator to create the instance of this mapper, which we're going to see below. And keep in mind, this stuff is only happening on startup once. So yes, there is going to be a little bit of reflection later on, and that will be a performance consideration. But if you bear with me a little bit longer, the other way that I want to do this, and it's not fully working, should hopefully work around some of these performance considerations. This is essentially all this here is going to set up an instance of a SQL mapper for these strongly typed IDs that should be able to handle representing a strongly typed ID going to and from a long. To go look at one of those implementations, it's actually very simple. This is basically borrowed right from Andrew Locke's example. It's just that I've made it a little bit more generic. So the way that we create the things and the way that we serialize those things, basically putting them into SQL, that's gonna be more generic. So you'll notice in here, this says nothing about my record ID, right? That strongly typed ID that I created. We don't see that anywhere here because this implementation should be able to support any of them that we create. If you're paying attention to the type parameters, you can see the long and long here. There's a long down here. And where I wanted to go with this was like, hey, look, if I have another type parameter, I should be able to extend this even further. In theory, I probably can do that for this one and make it more generic for things like strings and ints and date times. Like I said, I'm only using longs, but we're almost at the point where I'm going to show you what should be the much faster version. I just kind of want to connect the dots first, and then we're going to go look at that variation. What we have, if we put it all together, is we have some assembly scanning. It's going to look for all the strongly typed IDs. This for each loop is going to say for each one of those strongly typed IDs, that is mapping to a long, we're going to go set up one of these SQL mappers, one of these handlers right in place for Dapper. And it's just going to create an instance of one of these, and it should be able to handle any one of our strongly typed IDs that's backed by a long. So a whole bunch of code, but that means that we only have to basically create these things. And as long as we, if I scroll back up, as long as we just call this map handling for assemblies, it will go scan through all the assemblies and create all the necessary mappers as long as we have these defined. So we never have to go worry about creating more strongly typed IDs and going, oh crap, did I register that? Because if you don't register it, it's going to blow up for you at execution time. This was my approach for basically extending what Andrew Locke had to make it a little bit more dynamic and allow you to add stuff 
without having to worry about registering it. If we go look at how this stuff is getting mapped and handled, you'll see that I have to call this create callback when we want to go parse it. So we're reading in the stuff from SQL, from Dapper, right? We have to go call this create callback. And if we see what we were doing, I basically have to go use some reflection and call that constructor. That means it's not so great, right? It has the constructor info. I do have some benchmarks in a video that talk about this. Calling the constructor this way through reflection is definitely quicker than using activator create instance, but it's still slower than just newing something up especially if it's just a simple struct, like this is gonna have some overhead. For my current situation, it's not an issue. I don't have to worry about that. Again, my specific use case is that the execution time that this will take, not a big deal. I'm not trying to do a ton of things very fast in bulk. I'll be fine for my use case. However, I wanted to be able to walk through how we could make this more performant because I want to be able to use this approach probably going forward in systems where this is really going to matter for performance. And if I have to use any type of reflection like this in something that's performance critical, probably not gonna be a good time. And the same thing happens when we try to go the other way. When we try to write to SQL, we basically have to use reflection. Again, the method is cached here, so it's faster, but we still have to use reflection in order to get the value off that strongly typed ID. Definitely not ideal. So let's go look at the other way that I wanted to try handling this. And I'm gonna explain why it's not working and hopefully when it should start working. Okay, on my screen, I have one more class that looks very similar to what we just saw, but there are some differences that should make a tremendous difference when it comes to performance. And that's going to be using unsafe accessor. The idea here is that instead of using reflection in the traditional way, we're going to use unsafe accessor, and that's going to allow us to go access these things without having to use reflection at runtime. If you dig up performance benchmarks on these compared to using reflection, they're significantly faster. Basically, they're comparable to native access when you're not using any reflection at all. If you think about it, what I'm trying to do, this is create type instance, that should be replacing the constructor info call and get value should be replacing the other reflection call that I have that's essentially getting the long value off of our strongly typed ID. So these two things basically replace the reflection calls that I have. If you look at the parse and the set value methods, they're almost identical. I'm just calling these two other methods we're talking about instead of using reflection. But the problem here is when I tried to make this so generic is that these two things don't yet work with generics. I believe that I read this as coming in .NET 9. Depending on when you're watching this video, that might already be the case. Maybe this code will work, but at the current time of recording this video, this is with .NET 8. And .NET 8 has these available, but they don't work with generics. They look like they work right now, but when you call them, it basically says that you're not using this the proper way doesn't give you a lot of detail, but when I started searching around for anyone else running into that, it seems to come down to generics. What I'm hoping is that I can live with this slower approach for a little bit longer, because again, right now, it's not a performance bottleneck for me, I'm not too concerned, but I would like to follow up, hopefully, when these things are working with generics, because you can see that I am using a type parameter on them, right? If that is fixed in .NET 9, I will try to follow up with a video on that to show you, and I'll even try to benchmark it and show you the difference, because I think it should be pretty significant when you're dealing with stuff that's reading in tons of data or writing tons of data. That's gonna wrap it up for this video. So if you wanna see other types of reflection benchmarks, you can check out this video next. Thanks, and I'll see you next time.